Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour. Today I had the good fortune of interviewing a fascinating person, Dr. Norman Rosenthal, who has many amazing things about him. But the point of this interview is that he is the person who discovered Seasonal Affective Disorder, or SAD, and he has a new book coming out called A Guide to Health and Happiness Through All the Seasons. And what's really fascinating to me is that Dr. Norm, as some people call him, has a deep sense of internal connection. And it sounded to me through hearing his stories in this interview that he had that very young, that he knew who he was, he knew he could trust himself, and that he had parents that fostered that. And it was because of that deep inner trust that when he brought this theory forward through some experience of self and working with clients, and that the world of academia, some people didn't believe in it, they didn't think it had value, they didn't think he should be researching it, that he decided to continue. And now it's been four decades of double blind clinical trials, and he's had this magnificent career ending in this very user-friendly book called Defeating Sad. In this interview, we also talk about his decades and decades of yoga practice and meditation and how that brings him home to self on a regular basis so he can be more creative and have more success and find the support from the people that he needs. So we start off the interview talking about that practice that he's been doing for so, so many years and how that helps him maintain balance in his daily life. And it sounds like he has a really good daily self-care routine that involves walking outside, cardiovascular, weight training, proper nutrition, doing yoga, meditating twice a day. He's really figured out the elixir of life and how to maintain his health and happiness. And I really appreciate that because so many times, especially when we get to really high levels of accolades in our careers. He works at Georgetown Medical School. He's been featured on ABC News, Oprah Radio, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, PBS, Times Union, NBC. He's really a spectacular researcher. And yet he maintains this humility and this ability to find balance in his daily life and to keep his personal circadian rhythms in harmony with nature and I find that really remarkable. I was really happy to connect with him and also felt that we're both able to be present to one another, to have this deep heart connection, even though we've never met. And so I look forward to sharing this interview with you. There's a few things that I thought we would get to, but his storytelling was so magnificent that we didn't, but I'll put them in the show notes. And a couple of them are meta-analysis of randomized control studies about depression and things like that that I had looked up for the interview and we didn't really get there, but I'll be sure to put those in the show notes. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Dr. Norman Rosenthal. Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour. My name is Amy Wheeler and I'm your host. The Yoga Therapy Hour is here to support you on your mental, emotional, and spiritual journey. We talk about things like nervous system regulation, spiritual connection, how to be more involved in your community, how to communicate well, how to manage your mental health. There are so many things that we are excited to share with you in season five of the Yoga Therapy Hour podcast. And we hope that you will share it with your friends, family, colleagues. All right, let's get into today's episode. I'm so happy to welcome Dr. Norman Rosenthal to the podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Rosenthal, where are you located? I always like to give people kind of a, a grounding when we begin. I'm in Bethesda, Maryland. Okay. And I'm in Minnesota. I live in California, but I'm moving to Minnesota. So that's where I am. And I noticed that you're a clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown Medical School. 
So probably you live in Maryland and commute in as needed? As needed, yes. The District of Columbia is just close by. So mostly I'm operating out of here, my home office in Maryland. Wonderful. I am very happy to interview you today, not only to learn more about seasonal affective disorder, but also to get your take on how yoga is connected to these really good daily life habits that might help support us to kind of fend off seasonal affective disorder. But before we begin, I just want to get your story about how you got involved in yoga. It sounds like you've been doing meditation for almost 20 years and yoga, it sounds like maybe even longer. So tell us about that. I started to do yoga in South Africa when I was in my early 20s. I was a medical student and there was a yoga teacher that I met and I was interested in what she had to say. And she began teaching me and a friend of mine, Hatha Yoga, using the Shivananda routine, Mm. which is an absolutely wonderful routine. So I started doing it and I enjoyed it. I would go every week, usually on a Sunday morning and do yoga. And then when I came to the United States, I let it drop. But somewhere along the line, I picked it up again. I found a local teacher and she and I have now been working for over 20 years together. And believe it or not, she happens to teach the Shivananda routine. So Mm -hmm. I was just reflecting that here I am 50 years later doing this same routine, but it is spectacular. It has got elements of stretching, the asanas, a meditative component, and of course the aerobic component of the sun salutation. And so it's a very complete exercise. Unfortunately, my schedule only permits me to do it once a week, Mm -hmm. but I've done it faithfully once a week for the last 22 years. And it is a foundational habit of my well-being. It's quite a vigorous routine also. I mean, it's impressive that your body is still able to do those sun salutations and back bends. And if I remember right, there's even some maybe inversions involved. There are inversions. There are balancing exercises. There are, as you say, the sun salutations. And it is a vigorous routine. And I know that if I hadn't been doing it consistently, there is no way I would be able to do it. Right. And I push myself, you know, to do those sun salutations because there's a lot of evidence now that when you push yourself in a sort of disciplined way, it's good for you in various ways. I was going to say maybe that once a week, like you really kind of go to your edge. I think there's some research that supports that, that it's as long as we don't go too hard, that it's good to kind of maybe not go there every single day, but to go for a day and then rest for a few days. Yes, they do talk about intermittent high intensity exercises, and that is what it is really. Okay, but what interested me the most is in your bio, I saw that you had mentioned this state of Turiya, the ability to enter the fourth state of consciousness. And I don't hear that many yogis talking that way. Tell us a little bit about what that means to you. And if you've had a chance to enter in there once in a while, what do you think about Turiya? Well, yes, I do actually. And in fact, I wrote a book and that's not, I know the book we're talking about now because we're talking today about defeating sad and we will. Mm. The book I wrote was called Transcendence and Transcendence is Turiya. And it is a very amazing state of consciousness that I would not have actually believed existed had I not experienced it myself. Mm. The way in which I try to access that state twice a day is through transcendental meditation. And that, of course, is a discipline that's very allied to yoga because Mm -hmm. they both come out of the Vedic tradition. And it's interesting because in the Upanishads, it talks about a mind within the mind, a mind beyond the mind. Rest there, it suggests, rest there. And it's a beautiful description because 
where did the state of consciousness come from? How did it even arise? But it's this kind of mixture of relaxed thoughtfulness and excited sense of possibility. Creativity can come out of it. When I meditate and I go into the state, creativity comes out of it. But the other thing is that it happens between people as well. So when I'm working with my yoga teacher of many years, we go into a state of kind of blissful connection. And now many of my patients have done transcendental meditation. And as we start talking about it and the possibility of entering states of mind that are blissful and peaceful and at the same time enlivening, you wouldn't think that those were compatible states of mind because you think when you're peaceful, you want to go to sleep. And when you're blissful, you want to start dancing around. But in the state of Turiya, those two elements merge, they alternate, they merge. And that is a wonderful state to be in. And it begins to filter into your everyday life. So that sometimes when I'm talking with patients or clients who are also meditators, we enter into them into in our actual daily act of life. So it doesn't only happen when you're meditating, it begins to filter into your everyday life. And that in turn shapes your creative potential, your joy in ordinary things. And five years after I had written Transcendence, it occurred to me that actually this state of Turiya is infiltrating in a positive way my everyday life and actually altering my capacities in various ways. And then I wrote a second book called Supermind, where I surveyed, because it was internet interview, I surveyed over 500 regular TM meditators, and I assessed what were the elements of personality that had thrived and grown and developed as a result of their meditation. And it was very clear there was more creativity, there was more success in their work and in what they were looking to accomplish. There was a sense that even despite life's ups and downs, there was a steadiness of being that persisted. And there was what we call a support of nature. And that is that people seem to suddenly start doing things for you or being kinder to you because you're putting out a more positive vibe, they're reciprocating that. That's my interpretation. I think that's what's happening. You're changing as a result of this Turiya entering into your daily life, and it is influencing how people perceive you and how they respond to you. I was just having that thought because as I'm moving from California to the Midwest, there's definitely a different culture. And I feel like here in the Midwest, people are, they're slowed down a little bit. Someone will be literally on the sidewalk across the street and make an effort to make eye contact and wave and say hello. And that's just unusual in California for me. It made me happy. It made me want to start looking up while I'm walking and waving at others. And this exchange, even between strangers, it's as you say, what we put out starts to shift the external experience that we're having. So I have one more question about that because it's a really fascinating thought. You said that when you're in session with fellow meditators, sometimes the two of you can kind of experience this Turiya together. Are you able to sometimes to have that happen, even with someone who knows nothing about meditation. And we would call it co-regulation. It's almost like your nervous system and your mind kind of invite them into your state of relaxed alertness. Do you ever have that happen? I would definitely say so, because if you are going to be a successful therapist, you have to tune into where your client is. If you're in therapy with somebody, you need to really tune into where that person is. And then if you can accurately tune in, then you can perhaps make a comment that's just right on point and helps that person because it seems as though you really are responding to that person's essence. Mm -hmm. And I think that being very centered and very meditative enables me to do that 
better than I otherwise would. In yoga therapy, we say that you're not allowed to be a practitioner unless you yourself are doing a daily practice to get into these relaxed states of alertness where we can be more present. So I'm not sure they have that in psychiatry. Is that part well, of they your- do encourage people to get some therapy of their own, to get analyzed, to understand what's coming from me and what's coming from my clients so that we don't bring our past traumas into our interactions and we try and understand, you know, this is my thing that's going on over here and I don't need to bring it into the interaction. Beautifully said. Okay, well, let's move into SAD, Defeating Seasonal Affective Disorder, which is this book that you've written. And it's not separate from yoga because there's so many themes that are overlapping in terms of the circadian rhythms and the daily self-care practices. To me, when I read your work, it sounds like, you know, common sense, simple living, that that's the way to come out of SAD in addition to many things that you mentioned. But can I ask, how did, I mean, you basically came up with this theory and then you've done the research to test it and you've actually seen that in Florida, there's only a 1.4% chance of getting sad in the winter months, but in Oslo, Norway, it's more like 14%. So can you tell us how you came up about the theory before you even did the research to prove that it actually exists? Yes. Well, you know, in order to undertake research, you have to have a feeling of instinct or conviction that this line of study is worthwhile because it's so much work research. You're not going to commit that energy and that time and effort if you don't have a strong instinct that something is worth doing. So when I came to the United States from South Africa, South Africa is a very pleasant climate. When I came to New York City, of course, it's a dark Mm. place in the winter. And I remember that cold wind coming off the Hudson River after daylight savings time and feeling that kind of shiver of, my God, what's going on with the world right now? And of course, I'd never experienced it before. And that happened for three years running while I was in my residency. And then I came to the National Institute of Mental Health here in Bethesda, Maryland. And there I had to choose a research problem. And I came across an individual, a scientist, who had very severe seasonal depressions. And I thought, you know, I know how he feels. And mine was, thank God, not so severe, but I still had that experience that this was something interesting, real, actionable. And that's when, with the help of a journalist, we recruited a cadre, a cohort of these people with strong seasonal reactions. And that led to the description of the problem and to light therapy studies where we showed that it actually responds to bright light. And then that developed into a thing, as they say these days, an entity of treatment that now is being commercialized in a very good light therapy manufacturers that advertise their wares. And so that was years of research to really establish that because there was a lot of skepticism. I bet. I bet. What year was that that you were having this cold breeze come across the Hudson River? What year are we talking? 1976. Wow. Amazing. I mean, you've obviously dug one hole very, very deeply in your career if you're still doing that in 2023. Right. Well, you know, this book, Defeating Sad, this book represents four decades of work research and clinical work. And I thought of it as, you know, the closing of an arc Mm. in terms of just a whole complete volume. And yet I wanted to do it in a way that was very accessible. It's not a long book, even though it's a long arc, it's not a long book. It's not a difficult book, but I wanted to be extremely useful to the reader. That was the focus and pleasant because Mm -hmm. I feel like as a writer, because I've been a psychiatrist and I am a psychiatrist and a researcher, 
and a writer. As a writer, you want to produce things of beauty. Mm. Whatever you do has got to be beautiful. And so that's what I aspire to in my work. I think that's such a yoga concept, this idea of Maitri friendliness and mudito, you know, this appreciation just to create a state of mind where you're looking around in the world and feeling good and experiencing life as sweet. And so when I hear you say that about writing what could have been a very academic book, because you have all the RTC trials to support this, but to make it user-friendly, I think that's a whole nother level of refinement. The other thing that you said that really I can appreciate is four decades of clinical and research experience. And I think, you know, I was thinking about the researchers out there that are just like picking a breathing technique, just random breathing technique, and then they're testing it on people and they're not looking at their lifestyle. They're not looking at what they're eating. They're not looking at this more holistic approach. And I would argue that I'm not sure that the research is valid. It won't have the same effect on every single system. But what I love about what you've done is you're really looking at the problem of seasonal affective disorder from a holistic lens where you're looking at all sorts of lifestyle choices. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Definitely, because you know a lot of people think, well, I'll go and get myself a light fixture and I'll put it in front of my desk. And I think that that will just take care of the problem. And it does help. No question. It's always going to help. And sometimes it's going to help completely. But in many instances, it's just one part of a series of life habits that you need to undertake, foundational habits. So I do have chapters in my book on all these foundational habits, exercise, meditation, diet, just doing things that are good for you, you know, as a way of supplementing the light therapy and creating this multifactorial healthy lifestyle. Yoga, of course, is very key for me and for many people. I love that approach, the multifactorial approach, because as we say with chronic pain also, and probably almost every mental disorder that we can have, many things cause that problem. And the solution will also need many different interventions to help sustain balance again. Indeed, I agree. And so let's just talk a little bit about some of these daily lifestyle habits. Do you feel like in terms of exercise, do you feel like weight training versus cardio? Are there certain types of exercise? You've said yoga. And then also, are there certain times of day that you feel we should kind of get moving? Well, firstly, to your first point, I think both cardio and resistance training are important. So just this morning, for example, my trainer came over and we did some stretches and I had already done a walk, which is the cardio, fast walking, and then we did some resistance training. So I think that almost every day I do some cardio, then we add to that the resistance training about three times a week. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really critical. It's going to really affect how you age and how you do or don't get various illnesses. So I think that both of them are really critical. And there is a lot of research, including randomized controlled studies, that shows that both cardio and resistance training is antidepressant, that they both have effects on depression. And as a matter of fact, recently, there was a study published where they analyzed the step counts of people over years. And those that did their 10,000 steps had a significantly lower level of Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. than the others. So, and then if you did 5,000, it was good, but not quite as good. So, you know, with that kind of thing, it wasn't controlled. So you don't know whether the more capable people did more steps or more steps made them more capable. You can't really say, but I think there's something about keeping the blood moving and circulating and keeping the muscles strong because 
All of these are vibrant living organs. Well, you're an organism, but you have many <laughs> organs and each one of them sort of contributes to your well-being. So the muscles contribute, the heart contributes, the blood contributes. It's all one interconnected entity, your body and your mind. Beautifully said. And would you say that it's more important you went for a walk in the morning or do you just feel like, hey, get your movement in when you can? And because like for me in the mornings, I also get the light therapy in my eyes and I just feel better all day long. That exercise outdoors and looking up at the sky is just the best. Mm -hmm. um, it's so good. It's a combination of all those things and light, light therapy is more potent in the morning. So if you go for your morning walk, even if it's a bad day, and look up at the sky, it's a wonderful thing to do. And my husband always asks, because we walk our dogs in the morning, and he has very sensitive light eyes, like colored eyes, which are more sensitive. And so he wants to wear sunglasses. And he's always asking me, does it work if I have my sunglasses on? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think it's important that he be comfortable. So if the light is too bright for him and he's not comfortable, I would respect that. How does he feel? If he's feeling good and the dark glasses make him comfortable, then what's to complain about or change? If he has seasonal affective disorder, he might try and have glasses that maybe don't have such darkened lenses. See if you can mesh the interface between comfort to the eye and beneficial mood effects of light. And we also have a seasonal affective disorder lamp that I got many, many years ago. Do you think being outside is better than the lamp? But if you can't get outside and it's maybe gloomy and cloudy and dark where you live most of the time, or maybe even you live at a latitude that has so many hours of darkness, I'm assuming the lamp is a good idea, but is it better to be outside if you can? I think these things complement each other because the way things turn out practically is that you can't be outside all the time unless you're a farmer or something like that. So you are inside and at your desk a lot of the time or at the kitchen table or in your bedroom. And so the great advantage of the light therapy lamp which some people call a happy light and some people call a sad lamp because seasonal affective disorder has that acronym of sad. So it's, it's funny that a happy light is also a sad lamp. But anyway, the practicality of using it when you can and being outside, I would say the lamp should not be a substitute for going outside because that experience of being connected to nature, connected to your world, connected to the sky, connected to the natural light and the huge dome of the sky, especially out there in Minnesota, my sense is you're going to have a huge dome of the sky, although your days are going to be very short in the winter, and you're going to feel that difference. So you're going to need to use that lamp more because the mornings are going to come later and the evenings are going to come sooner and you're going to have more opportunity and necessity, perhaps. I don't know how seasonal you are, but anybody who's seasonal is going to need the indoor lighting to supplement the outdoor lighting, especially when you're in the north. You know, it does run in my family. SAD runs in my family. And I had noticed doing some research on you that there is kind of a hereditary impact on people. So I had bought this lamp many, many years ago even living in California, and I'll be bringing it back to Minnesota with me. And I seem to remember something about the angle at which the light is kind of coming down towards me is also important. It's, I seem to remember something, if you're outside, the sun in the morning is at a particular angle from your eyes that works well, but that you should also have your happy lamp kind of above you a little bit coming down. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, that's a very good thing to do. And here I'm going to turn this around and show you how where my lamp is, but I'm going to shut it first so that the mess on my desk is concealed. <laughs> You're sneaky. And show you how my lamp looks. Ah. See, it's facing is it, down. Is it on right now? 
No, but it can be. Okay. So even when you're working, do you do that for like maybe an hour a day or what is your protocol? I'll tell you, I'm at the stage where I know when I've had enough. It's Mm -hmm. like drinking coffee compared to drinking coffee. You know, if you have one cup, maybe another cup, maybe two more, maybe that's too much. You have an internal feeling of what is a good amount of life because you feel good. You don't feel racy. You don't feel overactivated, overbuzzed. You're just feeling good. And so I use it like, for example, just in the last week, I've started turning on the lamps in my bedroom. So you keep talking about the lamp as a singular entity. Mm -hmm. I would suggest, depending on your budget, that you get more than one lamp because you'll want one at the breakfast table, you want one at your desk, maybe one in the bedroom, in the morning, you may want three lamps. And as I say, depending on your budget, but it's really for what it costs, the delivery, what it gives you versus what it costs is a very favorable ratio. If it gives you your life back, it can be that serious, right? Exactly. Yes. It can threaten your work, it can threaten your relationships. I'm not saying your relationships, but you know, somebody might want to withdraw or not be available or not be warm or friendly when a spouse comes in. Mm. Uh, people who get into the depths of depression, they don't feel very inclined to be physical or amorous. And so those are very consequential developments. And if it can help you with those things, it's a worthwhile investment. Okay. So now the question, I don't know if you're allowed to comment on this, but I did a lot of research when I bought mine and it took me weeks to figure out which one I wanted. And is there a particular brand that we could trust? Well, the one that's in front of me, and I can definitely say this because I have no financial stake in any of these light companies, but the one in front of me is called the Daylight and it's by Carex. C-A-R-E-X. But I also, in my bedroom, I have lights by Sunbox here in Maryland, being a long-time provider of first-rate light boxes. So those are two brands. If you want light therapy on the go, the company of Verilux has a pad like iPad-like or that sort of tablet-like light boxes. So those are some of the companies that I have found to be useful. How does it feel to have done four decades of research and then have to abstain from investing in these companies that are using your research? Is that okay with you? I mean, I know it's probably ethical for the profession, but what do you? Well, I realized early that my credibility would be questioned. Mm. I would never recommend a light box that I didn't believe in. So I felt like, well, if I'm going to recommend what I believe in anyway, you know, why not get paid some kind of consulting fee or whatever? But it occurred to me that it would warp my, if not my opinions, it would warp the perception of Mm. my neutrality and my, because when I said those things that I said, this is what I use. This is what I recommend. It's not the only lights. There must be others. And in my book, there are some others mentioned. I'll try to be fair, but I think it would reduce my credibility, understandably. And, you know, there was so much skepticism about light therapy originally. Then turned out that I was hawking the items. It wouldn't look too good and it wouldn't be good for what I believe is really a a valuable contribution people can really benefit. I should mention actually that the effective lights that have been used in research studies all have surface areas of about one foot square. So don't get the teeny weeny ones just because they're cheaper. And I'm talking about the desk models here because they're probably not gonna deliver enough light as the bigger ones. And is there a certain number of lumens? I remember when I was doing my research, it was like, make sure you get over 10,000 lumens or something like that. Well, they're going to advertise that it's 10,000 lux at a certain distance. But when you're dealing with the very small ones, 
I think that number can be deceptive because mm. when you move your head, it rapidly falls off the number of lux, which is the light measurements. And so the bigger surface area is more comfortable and I think quite valuable for the treatment effect. I find this thing that you mentioned about the dose response relationship and how that's individual for each of us. And I love what you said about you may feel like for you personally, you had too many cups of coffee. So it sounds like kind of a buzz if you do too much. So is there any problem with doing it after a certain time of the day? Like I don't have caffeine after one o'clock or I can't sleep. Would the same be true with light therapy? It can be, you know, if you use it at night, you can keep yourself awake in an unwelcome fashion. Mm. So I would definitely ask you to be careful. I mean, some people can do it in the evening and get away with it, but it certainly can keep you up at night. And especially people who tend to be hyper at times, whether they're bipolar or whether that's just their temperament, be careful not to overuse it. It is potent. Yeah. It's a medicine. And if there's a problem with your eyes or you have a history of hypomania or mania, check it out with your doctor before you really give it a go. Perfect. How does it feel? I mean, in yoga, we talk about dharma or life purpose. How does it feel to have found this seasonal affective disorder, discovered it as a young man, to have so much skepticism at the beginning. And I'd love to know how you overcame that and continued on. But the first question is, how does it feel to have four decades? And then, as you said, the arc is coming to a completion. Does that feel good inside of you? Well, the word Dharma has often occurred to me because I think it has been my Dharma, which is simply to say it's been my way, it's been my path. And I was 16 and in high school when I was asked what did I plan to be when I was an adult. And I said, I want to become a psychiatry researcher. I want to research the workings of the mind. And so that is how I landed up at Columbia, which was a very good psychiatric program. And that then led me to the NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, which was a foremost mental health research entity. And there I came across some very gifted and creative and brilliant people. And they were very helpful to me in forging my own career path. And I tried many different things before I landed up on this, because this one seemed to me a meaty question that could yield a lot of study and a lot of work. And so it feels incredibly satisfying. And I'm so happy that a lot of people have benefited from it. And But I did have other aspirations. And one of my aspirations was also to be a writer. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a researcher. And I wanted to be a writer. And I wanted to be a writer maybe more than anything. Mm. And I came to my dad and he said, what are you going to be? And I said, well, I'd like to be a writer. And he said, you don't make a living from being a writer. Unfortunately, <laughs> he was right, except for a few very, very successful commercial writers. It is not a way to a comfortable living for most people, but it is a wonderful thing to do if you do have another way of supporting yourself. So this actually, this is my 11th book now. Oh my goodness. And I've written about this subject and other subjects, a very wide diversity of subjects. I wrote about my book before this was The Healing Power of Poetry. It was called Poetry Rx. And another book was The Gift of Adversity. And then there are two books on transcendental meditation, The Transcendence and Supermind. So these are all things that express the diverse interest. I'm endlessly curious about what I see. And I think, oh my God, I've got to write about that. But what I've done with this book is it's a very condensed book. Look how thin it is. Yeah. Because people don't have a lot of time to read these days. So I've put everything I know in the simplest, most elegant form in this book. I also did something else. 
most of my other books were voice recorded. There's Audible, almost all the other books, which I love to listen to books because I can walk and I can look at the sky and I can look at nature and I'm getting this wonderful book coming in and I'm in heaven. So this time I thought, I've got to record the book myself. Wow. And of course, I wanted them to hear it like straight from the horse's mouth. So I actually, I did some voice lessons because you have to sustain the strength of your voice when you're talking. And, you know, I know that these voice actors that did my other books, they've got the most gorgeous voices. And I thought, I've also listened to books where the actual discoverer or the inventor or whatever has actually read the book. And there's something about the authenticity of that experience of hearing it from somebody who really knows He's been there and he's done that. And I've been in my, I don't even know how many patients I've seen over the years and wonderful people that I've been privileged to know. And I wanted the listener in this particular book to have that same experience that those people have when they're sitting there in my office. I actually looked you up and listened to some of your videos, and there is something so powerful about the vibrational effect of your voice coming out of a vessel that has done the clinical work and the research for four decades. I mean, I think those vibrations actually are different. Nothing against the the readers. I'm sure they're wonderful, but there's such a truth that emerges vibrationally and so I'm really happy to hear that. I will be getting, is it going to be on Audible soon? Or is oh, it- yes. It, next week it releases in Wonderful. print and Audible at the same time. And incidentally, thank you for saying that. It means a lot to me that the vibrations are good ones. Yeah. I want to go back to something that you said a couple of times now, and I think it's so important for our listeners because when we are finding our truth, finding our dharma, there will always be obstacles. There will always be critiques and people who don't agree with what we're doing. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you got through that, because I'm sure it was not easy. Well, it was interesting. I have always been somebody who has believed what I see and not what I hear, if you know what I mean. And when I saw these people suffering so with the winter depression, and I had felt it myself. And I saw them come to life when we started first with the light therapy. That was one of the most beautiful experiences in my whole life was to predict something and see it happening. It's like you're waiting for the sunrise and you're predicting that the sun's going to come up over the horizon. And it does and you're affirmed that there's a meaningful, systematic set of forces in the universe that are powerfully orchestrated. When I saw that, and then I heard the disclaimers of other people, I disregarded them. I realized I had to replicate the findings. I had to really do the work. But I also understood that some people were actually well, there's a lot of competitiveness in the research world, and they were very competitive. And when they began to get very angry at me and wanting to trivialize the work, something in me said, they wouldn't be that angry if it wasn't important. Mm, I like that. As they developed Rancor, and not everybody, just some people, other people were thrilled to have a new tool at their disposal. As they developed Rancor, I thought, you know, it must be important. I better really continue to pursue it because if they're that upset about it, it's probably something good there. So that's how I overcame it. That's so interesting that they took you seriously enough to push back and try to thwart is the right word. But basically, I think indifference is really more of a threat than someone kind of using their life force to try to tell you what you're doing doesn't have value. Well, indifference is a harder emotion to contend with because anger, okay, now we're on wrestling. It is, you can be more active, but if you're indifferent to somehow 
generate a signal. It's interesting, you know, Schopenhauer, the philosopher, is quoted by saying, all truths go through three stages. I was going to mention that. I couldn't remember the philosopher's name, so please. The first stage, well, would you like to say what they are? Because I would love for you. You'll say it much more eloquently than I would. Uh, all <laughs> truth goes through three stages. At first, they say it's not important. Right. And secondly, they say it's ridiculous and they violently oppose it. And yeah. thirdly, they say it's obvious. Exactly. So the indifference is that first stage. The fighting is that second stage. And that third stage is where we are now with seasonal affective disorder. We got through the indifference, we got <laughs> through the resistance, and now it's accepted. And But it's obvious. Did you always have this, you said, I depended on my own perception and my experience more than what I was hearing other people say. Were you born with that? Did your parents instill that? Did yoga help with that? I think a lot of it was intrinsic. I had a skeptical mind. And one of the books, one of the childhood books that I really loved was Alice in Wonderland, mm -hmm. because Alice is field independent. And even though there are adults all around her, she doesn't take what they say necessarily as the truth. She's got her own opinion. And I saw the people around me, and many times they would say something, and it was clearly wrong, or mm -hmm. they would hold on to something, and it didn't make any sense. And so I started being very skeptical of people's opinions, not everybody's opinions. Sometimes they were right, and sometimes they were wrong, like everybody. And I noticed that as a very young boy, that a lot of things that people did or said were illogical. <laughs> you know, in the gift of adversity, I've got a little story. We had a substitute teacher in third grade called Mrs. Brown. <laughs> I have a bad feeling about Mrs. Brown right now. <laughs> she spelt the word ruler, R-U-L-A-R, which, of course, is incorrect. And I came home, and I've written this in The Gift of Adversity. I told my parents that this is how you spell ruler. And they said, oh, no, no, it's R-U-L-E-R. -E I said, oh, no, 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 she said, this is what she said. And they started to laugh. And I realized that they were not only laughing at her for misspelling a simple word, but they were laughing at me for my innocence and my naivete to imagine that a teacher would always be right. So I credit them, in a way, with reinforcing my sense that the authority is not necessarily right. And I think that, I mean, that was not the only incident, but that's like what we call a screen memory, which is a memory that sort of embodies something that must have happened many times. You know, my mother was a very smart person and very critical, and she held no respect for authority if she disagreed with them. And I remember her saying, I would ask her many, many questions, and she would say, that's enough questions. I've had enough. And I would say, but you know, Socrates said, the unconsidered life is not worth living. She said, well, that might have worked for Socrates, but it doesn't work for me. So she was a very smart and not always curious, but a very smart and very logically effective person. She was a brilliant bridge player. So I got some of my independent thinking from her. You know, in one of the Yoga Sutras, I think it's chapter one, verse seven, it says, first, we kind of get our information from authority. Then we start learning to figure out what's real and is truth through inference. And finally, it's internalized. And it sounds like at a very young age, you are encouraged to go inward and say, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. true. It's a well put, well put. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like we've had a wonderful discussion today. I just want to ask, is there anything else you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask you about? Well, as you can imagine, I certainly want you to plug my book. Yes, yes. I, yeah, I, I also about. want to say, because I've been thinking, 
that I've told you little vignettes and stories and things in this interview that I don't believe I've ever told anybody in an interview. So there's just something about your charm that has elicited a great sense of trust and camaraderie in me. And I thank you for that. I feel emotional about that. As you have found your dharma for decades, I feel this podcast is one of my small offerings to the world. And I do feel that I, with you, can be in a state of Turiya together, and there's some goodness between us. And I appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you. And I would like to add that in case people think of Turiya as a stuffy, intellectual state, it's very, very blissful. There's mm. tremendous joy and bliss in that experience, a sort of peaceful, but also enlivening. Yeah. And there's actually a description of Turiya that I have written down in one of my books. And if you have a minute, I'll find I it. I would love to hear that. You because it's from the Tao Te Ching. Okay, so I'm going to read, I'm going to read a quote from the philosopher, the Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, from his classic work, the Tao Te Ching. Become totally empty. Quiet the restlessness of the mind. Only then will you witness everything unfolding from emptiness. See all the things flourish and dance in endless variation. And once again, merge back into perfect emptiness. Mm. So that from a different tradition, now that's not from the Vedic tradition, that's from a Chinese tradition, showing you a state of mind that is at one moment empty and at another moment filled with bliss and vibrancy and then back to the emptiness. So there's this kind of internal flux going on that is not just emptiness. I think of it as parts of the whole, right? Mm -hmm. In certain traditions, it's more about emptiness and other traditions, it's about fullness. And maybe it's like the moon, it just circles from emptiness to fullness and both. Beautiful are... analogy, beautiful image. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Rosenthal. It's been our pleasure to host you, and we're so honored that you would take the time. And, you know, the book that you have coming out right around the time that this interview will be released, which probably end of August, and I'll let everyone know when it's coming out. But your new book is called Defeating Sad, A Guide to Health and Happiness Through All the Seasons. And I'm sure it will be on places like Amazon in addition to the Audible listening version. Yes, indeed. And as a matter of fact, it is actually coming out a little sooner. I know probably that you can only get this up and running at the end of August, and I respect that. But just to cue you into the facts of the matter, it comes out next Tuesday, the 5th mm -hmm. of August. Congratulations. And who's the publisher on this book? It's G&D Media. They did my last book, which is Poetry Rx. Okay. And uh, they did well by me with that book. So they've taken on this book as well. And I think our listeners, you know, going back to some of your previous books, I think the gift of adversity we'd all be very interested in. And then also Transcendence and Supermind. I mean, I think our listeners might like many of your books in addition to the Defeating Sad, A Guide to Health and Happiness Through All the Seasons. Well, thank you. You know, even though each one is its own thing, it's all part of a journey. Mm -hmm. And that journey is my journey. But I hope it also in some ways is everybody's journey because it's a journey of discovery, of discovering the things that are important to one, and the feelings and thoughts that go along with that journey. And it is my dharma, and I'm very, very grateful to the universe for mm -hmm. having given it to me. As you might read, if you read The Gift of Adversity, you will see that at age 24, I was attacked in South Africa and stabbed nearly to death. Mm -hmm. And 
it was a miraculous thing that I escaped, I recovered, because this whole story we've told today, the whole story we've heard today, these four decades of work and research, they could not have occurred had it not been for the good fortune and the good doctors who saved me at that time. So life is really strange. Sometimes it can be very brutal and sometimes it can be very wonderful. And this hour with you has been very wonderful. So I thank you for that. I thank you, Dr. Rosenthal. If I may say, Om Shanti. Hmm. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you, Dr. Norm, for being with us today. That was such a serene experience. I came to the interview feeling a little bit anxious and checking in with my interoceptive awareness to try to understand what was going on in my internal system. But by the end of the interview, I felt sattvic. I felt homeostasis in my system. I felt some co-regulation happening. I felt really, really good just being in connection with his calm, alert nature, his humility, his sensitivity, his presence. And I think that would make for a fabulous psychiatrist. And I noticed he also does coaching, personal coaching. And I think that's kind of interesting because whether you have SAD or you're just looking for better health and happiness, and you'd like to work with someone who has the medical knowledge of psychiatry, who knows all the research out there, but yet has the humanness of just being with someone, I think you would be a great person to work with. So I highly recommend that you check out Dr. Norman Rosenthal. I'm going to show his website here, which also features his book. And his website is drnormanrosenthal.com. And you can see that there's ways to get in touch with him for speaking engagement, for private practice, for psychiatry and coaching. It gives his complete list of services. And I also noticed that he's really gotten into long COVID and seasonal affective disorder. So for some of you that are suffering from long COVID, I think you should look into that also. All right, everyone, have a great week. It's been wonderful being with you and we'll talk soon. A special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines. Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada. Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria. And Peter Morley, who wrote and produced the music for this show, who lives in Australia. Find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.